is we're gonna connect history, society, music, sound, and experience. We're doing a musical comparison between the 65 Watts Rebellion and the 1992 LA Uprising. Jazz in 65, hip hop in 92, all LA artists, we decide what it is, what it's gonna be, and how it's gonna be. Especially in a time right now when everything's really stressful right now, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. There's things we need to overcome as an individual and as a people collectively. The jazz side and the hip hop side and bring it together and really show the people that the music really carries the movement. We are in California and those children of slaves are still here. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, children. We're gonna turn this party out. You know, we have the power, and more than we have the power, we are the power. Tamales of old came in all shapes and sizes. They were meat, seafood, vegetable. Some were filled with corn. Tamales could be wrapped in corn husk, banana leaves, and uh, avocado leaves. Since I'm a connoisseur of tamales, I'm gonna give you a little bit of history on it. First of all, tamales come from the word tamali, a language spoken by the Aztecs. Tamales have been written about since pre-Columbian days. Usually hundreds of tamales are made and shared with families and friends and enjoyed. La Doña is one of the best tamale places here. I'm driving all the way from Seal Beach just to get like six dozens of tamales. So. And what I like about this place, they make fresh tamales each day. Boy, the chile verde. So when I walked in, you could see the assembly line. And then I see the gentleman uh, peeling the fresh corn. Then they shred the corn. Then they put in this great big machine and it's called molido. They smash it. And when they take it out of the machine, they put the ingredients, they are steamed and finally eaten. They're great. Terrific. La Doya, owner of this great place. I'm traveling to Buena Park to go visit my dad and eat tamales together for breakfast. This is our tradition. La Doya in Compton. Great tamales. Waking up with the waves on Friday, I'm Surf Junkie Jeff with your Alt 98.7 Surf Report with a special edition for the LA Weekly at a super secret location. When it comes to surf language, you can't just sort of throw it into conversation unless you're a surfer or it makes you look like you're a ridiculous carpet bagger. Shaka. Pitted. Shock attack. <laughs> Gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> out there this morning. We've got a little of that northwest energy in the water, a little bit of that southwest swell out there. Most of this neck of the woods is seeing knee to waist high waves, a few stomach high waves, maybe the occasional chest high set. If you're planning on paddling today, break out that 3-2 full suit with that water temp hanging between 64 and 66 degrees. I'm Surf Junkie Jeff. You like saying how high the waves were and like which way they were going and how they were like lining up. I mean that it was knee high, which means the waves are only up to your knee. But a 3-2 could feel like a 4-3 if it has some like special drying fibers in it. He was talking about different thickness of wetsuits. Oh, the super secret spot. There was a super secret spot. <laughs> it was pretty accurate. It was like, hey, surf Jeff in the morning. Like, Good morning. answer, buddy. That's me right now. I'm talking to you. <laughs> For real? Hey, you know what? Because of that answer, you're getting a bar of wax nice. on the Sweet. house. Sweet. <laughs> you. I like days when there's just endless ramps where the faces are just so great that you can <laughs> when I catch the wave I feel really proud and accomplished dolphins the dolphins are pretty cute too. it's a really amazing feeling just like getting out there and paddling and catching it it's just incredible well, over the years it has evolved from ho dads and bitchin to kooks and sick or radical you know your average surf terminology that has been passed on from generation to generation if you're going to speak the language, you have to walk the walk. And by walk, I mean walk on the board. Walk on the water. If you're gonna grab a few, get out at least that 3 2 full in the morning with that water temp hanging between 62 to 64 degrees. We started Green Bar in 2004. One of the reasons that we located in downtown LA is to become part of 
downtown's revival. When visitors come to Green Bar, they'll have a chance to see everything that happens at a distillery. It's fun to, to know how the liquor that gets in a bottle, how it's made. So we built a distillery kind of like an open kitchen where you come to the tasting room and you look out and you see the entire operation before you. Everything begins in our fermentation tanks. After fermentation, we do incredibly precise distillation. After fermentation and distillation, we do a quick filtration. Finally, we age, and after that, we bottle and ship out to all over the country. Today, we make the largest portfolio of organic spirits in the world. Uh, for us, being in LA, we try to channel all the things that make California unique. And truly, Green Bar could not exist anywhere but in Los Angeles. It was really an opportunity to take our love for the performing arts to the next level and making a big statement and message in uh, downtown Los Angeles. built in 1927 by the United Artists group. They realized as they were starting United Artists they didn't have any place for them to showcase their films. So this was really the first place that they decided to, to build so that they actually could be showing their pictures. So it was run off and on uh, from 1927 to 1989 as a theater. But in 1989, it closed as a, a movie theater. So we purchased the building in 2010. This is the lobby of the theater. Three stories, it's 40 feet. It was inspired, obviously, by the uh, Spanish cathedral, Segovia. You'll look at the details, and this is all original to the building. So we're in the theater, 1,500 seats. On the, the sides is where the original organ pipes were housed. We still have the original fire curtain, which includes the phrase, the picture's the thing. Up above in the dome, you see 3,000 broken glass discs. We've done everything from LA Dance Project to movie premieres. So we opened in 2014. Our first show was Spiritualized, and since then, we've had over 120 shows a year, sold over 200,000 tickets. Hello, my name's Steve Jones. I've got a new book out called Tales of a Sex Pistol. And, uh, there's little Steve. Uh, there's my real daddy who I only met in 2008. It's all in here, warts and all. What would Elvira wear if she ever wore a different dress? What would Cassandra wear out and about? So we wanted to take her classic, iconic dress that Elvira wears and take it and translate it to a couture piece that you could wear, red carpet, weddings, wherever you want to wear. You're supposed to feel like Elvira in that gown. <laughs> if, there's, if there's one thing that signifies um, Elvira, it's boobs out. So let's... <laughs> Everyone is beautiful. No matter what you look like, beauty comes from within and how you feel. I'm very happy that designing clothing and that couture for everybody is, is my life. It's a lot of fun and it's extremely rewarding and, and, and gratifying. It's a trip, I mean, to like know, people are like, oh, you famous. I don't, personally, I don't look at it like that, but I do get what they mean, but it's just like, it's a regular ass dude that just skate, you know what I'm saying? And shit just worked out. What's up, it's Theodis Beasley. I'm a professional skateboarder. I'm from Inglewood, California. My cousin got me into skateboarding, my cousin Reef. One day, off the big three at the skate park, I'm um, trying to nollie heel off the big three for a couple of hours, and Andrew Reynolds came there, pro skateboarder. And uh, he seen me trying to trick for hours, so I finally landed. He comes over, he's like, yo, I want to hook you up. That was dope. So he remembered the city I lived in, and he went looking for me. Shout out to my dog, which means a lot. That day came the right place at the right time. I mean, I didn't. If I didn't go to the skate park that day, when I met Andrew Reynolds, I mean, I don't know what I'd be doing. And uh, after that, things slowly start to pick up and then start getting more sponsors. And I mean, coming from Inglewood, I mean, I didn't really have much. You know what I mean? And, um, when I get a trick, I'll show my mom. So, oh, that's cool. Yes, yeah, so her mom's always been supportive. Through skateboard, I've been able to travel. And I went to the Philippines, seeing kids out there like, whoa, he got my board. Like. 
That's tight. You all on the other side of the country. It's a blessing to have that uh, impact on a person's life. I mean, don't let nobody tell you that you can't be some in life. If you're working at it every day, your craft is going to happen. If you start getting money or whatever it may be, don't let that change you because it could be gone the next day. Just be you. I mean, when you be yourself, greater things going to come to you. Clovio Rojas in Mexico, they don't have easy access to healthcare, so we are providing an essential service to them. We are a fellowship for international service and health, more commonly known as FISH. We are based out of the University of California, Los Angeles. We drive down to Mexico and set up a clinic that is completely free of charge to the residents. A lot of them just stumble upon us. Ah, porque tiene una, una atención especializada con cada individuo. In Spanish, we say un clinica uh, gratis, meaning a free clinic. Our stations that we go through include check-in. The next station is BMI. Uh, where we analyze body fat. They kind of hold it like this. Presión arterial. In this station, we measure blood pressure. ¿Usted hace ejercicio diario? Sí, diario. Our final station would be vitamins. For kids, we have multivitamins, and for adults, we give two kinds of vitamins. Por vitaminas. Por vitaminas, que son las que me hacen bien. Seeing the difference as poverty levels just because of a line in the dirt is absolutely crazy. I think when we come back to these communities, it's great to see uh, people that we've seen before. Uh, they come back, they smile, they greet us, and they're making better life choices. Yeah, lives are changing. I think the most satisfying part of this trip for me was to be able to help these people who wouldn't otherwise have anything other than what we bring to them and that feels really good when you come home after that. Teaching the new generation, young kid, how to appreciate food. I learned how to make Okay. They came, they are very shy. When I first got here, I was nervous. First, I had to peel um, whole potatoes, and then we mixed it with eggs, cornstarch, and flour. To have them in the potato, mash the potato, after roll it. I mean, they, I want them to have a feeling. And then we cut it. And then we did this like rolling thingy to make an imprint on it. We let it cook for a little bit. It tastes amazing. The chef is really a good teacher. He's kind of like a professional. You know, sometimes we forget about kids. You know, and there's a there's a next generation. So we need to train them very well and to be good in the future and be good for the planet. For over 10 years, students have been coming and they've been cooking with us and they've become little chefs and little gardeners. So the opportunity to have almost an acre of like beautiful, safe, green space in the middle of this community um, is a real blessing for them and a real blessing for all the people that get to work in it. So today we did a pretty typical cooking class. We used kumquats from the kumquat tree and we made a sour kale winter salad. Mango, sugar stack peas, every kind of fruit. They have one garden teacher and I have like 800 beautiful garden students and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. So you have to come here. more than 30 years out, live in the world of inflatables. It's kind of a developing a dialogue between me and the wind. It's like a poetry that every time is different. Very wonderful word in Hebrew and in Arabic, which is called ruach. It has two meanings. One is wind, but the other one is spirit. I feel like I'm visualizing the spirit of nature. Using the the red line is a metaphor for, for a vein, a vein of blood drawing with it in locations around the world that were destroyed because of climate change and also sometimes immense misuse of nature. I studied industrial design in a college in Jerusalem and to make my living I used to sell this ones. 
And that inspired me to develop the long twisty balloon that today is 500 feet long. When I'm working with the, with the young ones, I'm trying to bring to them the beauty of simplicity. Everything that they have around them can be used as an inspiration to create a better future for themselves. And also so many things that we have around us are just beautiful. The chef comes in pretty early in the morning around 9 o'clock and she prepares the dough. The noodles are freshly made as you order. It twists around the dough and then beat it until the doughs are evenly shaped. We cut them into small pieces of dough for each bowl, each serving, and then she will pull it as you order. The noodles can be made into all kinds of shapes. It can be round or um, flat noodles or even triangle noodles. Each type of noodles has a different texture to it and different shape, but everything still is freshly handmade. I'm here because I have a passion for the 1920s, for history and fashion and culture, the aesthetics, and I love the music, to dance and sing and drink champagne. It's really the Roaring Twenties. Come back to the 21st century. <laughs> and what better way to immerse yourself in that culture than to be a part of it? <laughs> world-famous instructors, people who flew in from all over the world to teach. And then we also have amazing shows at night with bands. We have a late-night speakeasy that goes until 5 a.m., like you would do it in the olden days. It's really giving you an exposure and a taste of all of it, from the Carousel at Griffith Park to Barnsdale Art Theater um, to Elysian Park and a lot of other places throughout Los Angeles. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, this is a black guy singing Mexican music. It all started when I was eight years old. So I didn't even know like a word of Spanish, but I heard a song called Gasolina by Daddy Yankee. It was in the genre of reggaeton, which a lot of Latinos in Compton and Los Angeles listen to. All my friends are Mexican, so you know, I started saying, oh, la gasolina. 
I love horses. My dad used to take me up to Griffin Park to ride horses. Then I moved to Paris, and that's when I owned my very first horse. We have over a thousand people here ready to see him. So tonight you're gonna be overwhelmed by his performance. He could potentially be the Eminem of Mexican music. Solo quiero decir a toda la gente que me apoya. Si alguien tiene un sueño muy grande, pues sí. Sigue para adelante, puro para adelante, pariente de por su amigo compa negro. When I'm up there, I feel good knowing that I'm representing where I come from, I'm representing my roots. Yeah, I was born and raised on the east side of LA. I have these roots going back to my dad and what he does. My dad has been a mariachi his whole life. His father was a mariachi, my grandfather. There goes back six generations on his side. My mother was a flocorico dancer. She toured with Linda Ronstadt for many years. When I was 12 years old, I started playing rock music. When I was 19, I opened my studio, the Earth Capital, and offered my services. I wanted to be an affordable option for bands with a message, Latinos, Hispanics, all over LA. At the end of the day, I'm helping my community the best I can, and it's inspiring. And if I can carry that across through what I'm doing to people, then my job is done. No es que yo quiera, se... 30 years of custom shop experience, there is no limit what we can deliver. If you can dream it, we can make it. We have our giant presses here. We've had these presses since the 50s, uh, 60s and 70s, and they'll cut the shape out of the neck. One of the most unusual requests was, uh, was from Prince. He had a dream that he opened one day the case, and inside was guitar entirely just covered with gold. And he said, I want that kind of guitar. When I was told that material from Hollywood Bowl is available, and obviously, you know, the guitar itself is just fantastic sounding instrument, number 42. You have to measure everything. Over here on this side, this is where we do our uh, buff and polish for the guitars. The guitar comes with this small B25 bomber. Well, these boxes are actually full of brand new Fender guitars ready to go out to our distributors. But it's a great responsibility to work here and deliver guitars the best I can. Welcome to the show down in Little Tokyo, where we eat gyoza by the truckload. To become one with the gyoza. A lot of preparation goes into this, and I came prepared today. The night before the event, I usually uh, keep it pretty light. I think like the gyoza. It's a 10 minute sprint. That's 30 seconds to go! 30 seconds to go! It feels amazing to win this contest. You know, it's got a little personal pride, you know, just um, you know, just representing the Nisei generation, the Japanese culture. Shifting into high gear, about to eat more gyoza than I did last year. Piping hot, straight off the stove. I can't wait to eat more gyoza. So everyone's had that flying dream when they were growing up. This is the most immersive experience that gets you to that childhood feeling. When I'm flying, I feel like I'm basically playing a VR video game. When you start racing, it's kind of like falling into a black hole. You just can't stop. Got about 75 pilots out here. Top five pilots gonna be in the drone nationals. Anybody can be in it. 12 years old, 60 year old, it doesn't matter. Uh, we teach the young people uh, what they need to know in order to, to fly these. And you ought to see the smile on their faces once they get their crafts all like flying and tuned up right. If a lot of kids learn this, then in the next generation will be a lot easier flying drones. We know that white sharks serve an important role in our coastal ocean. So this nine foot shark is only just beginning to get big enough to start to feed on marine mammals. The Shark Lab's been at Cal State Long Beach since 1969. My students and I are able to go out to either catch them or tag them. These are what we call pop-off satellite tags. These get darted into the shark's back, and this has a light sensor, a temperature sensor, and a depth sensor. It stores all that data, and then at a pre-described time and date, this pops off and then downloads all that data to a satellite. The other technology we use are called Mo Underwater Video Systems. The sharks are curious and they'll swim right up to the camera and take a selfie. So white sharks are just like people. They have unique facial markings. So right now we're working with computer programmers to develop facial recognition software for white sharks. Every time I go to a school and I talk to kids about sharks, to see them 
and wanting to do more to protect our ocean. And I think that's been paying out over time. completely came about uh, by accident, oh. discovering what it is that it makes it, it 3D. I did an image transfer of the face of Jesus, and it's now Jesus on toast. Well, I kind of wanted the softer side of skateboarding, so I approached it from an ecological standpoint. The yeah. piece is called Natural Disaster. It's one of those things you couldn't have planned on happening. But it happened, and I made the most of it. <laughs> Sometimes you see things up close that you obviously don't see far away. See things far away that just kind of blend into it. I was so overwhelmed with Burma that I decided to do a book when I got back and to donate all the proceeds to the Burmese people. Next to impossible to build glass completely by yourself. Um, so we work together. We are self-taught. I had asked several girls to photograph them before that and they were like, oh no, no. But once you put the veil on, they were like not as shy. We help transform any two-dimensional design or art piece that an artist may have into three-dimensional piece. Combining art and different processes, materials and equipment and tools and technology is a combination of art and science. The crew that we have all come from different backgrounds. Some come from metalsmithing, from special effects industry, from illustration. A majority are females and a few very handsome gentlemen. As we are able to take somebody's idea and translate it into something that's tangible, that you can actually put your hands on. And seeing the excitement on an artist's face for the first time they view their piece is a huge reward. And then taking that to the public so that everyone else can see that and they look at the piece and they're like, how did they do that? So every day I come in and I have two assistants and we set up for the day segment, mostly two cooking segments where we actually do demos. Creativity is probably the thing that drives me most in my life. Um, symmetry and balance is the catalyst for the way that I style food. I look at the colors, I look at the seasons, how I'm feeling that day, how the colors make me feel. And then I go from there and I take the textures and the organic nature of whatever material I'm using, and I kind of make it look how I want it to look and balanced. You can manifest anything you want if you have genuine love for it and you're willing to work hard. I absolutely believe that. And I think that I'm a, a good example of where you can be if you, you know, put your mind to it and look to the stars. smell of blood and gunpowder. It seemed like a, an eternity when it only lasted for me about 20 minutes. Right about our fifth song in, I noticed that these gunmen appeared. And you don't ever, ever think about that. I'm gonna get killed for mixing a rock and roll band in a Paris nightclub. What I noticed was their ammunition kept going out every after every 20 rounds. I grabbed up everybody and ran out side as fast as we could. Coming back to Venice and being with my friends, it was almost like being reborn again. Feel the sunshine on my face and riding to the, to the pier and just staring at the ocean. I slowly am getting back to normalcy because I'm not gonna let a terrorist bring me down and my will to live, ever. Jay was the most ripping Z-boy that there ever will be. We're so sorry to not have him in our company anymore. There's thousands of people here on the beach today. Everyone that came out today, your life, Jay Adams, will touch theirs, and it will change their lives for all eternity. He started off as my anti-hero, and later on in life, the path he took and the peace that he found at the end, he became my hero. He never forgot where he came from. You know, and that's his neighborhood. Jay was inspirational. The number one Z-boy out there, Ripper! Gnarly. Hey, Jay Adams will be Venice Originals for life. So I feed off the energy of the clapping and the cheering. It's all right here in Venice Beach. I grew up here skating at this beach. 
you're out in nature, you know, the ocean's there and it's really healing. I believe that the things that you learn in skateboarding are parallel to everything in life. Skateboarding is it's not just a sport, it's a lifestyle. It has allowed a lot of the kids that grow up in this neighborhood to have a platform. Shane Borland, now he's one of the top transition skaters in the world. And then you got people like Melissa. Aggressive girl skater. Oh, there's Desmond Shepard, quintessential punk rock kid. Like Hayden McKenna. His dad's a part of that roots, and it's beautiful to see the um, the legacy carried on. And now my son skates. One of the proudest moments for me. It's all because of the breeding ground. And that's why I'm here. I'm here for the kids. I'm here for the community. I'm here for my Venice. If you don't have a hard on for what you're doing, like who else is gonna have a hard on for what you're doing? And I always wanna keep it pretty raw and pretty like simple. When I was 11, my teacher at school saw me kind of wandering around. I was a little bit of a loner at school and she handed me a cello and um, game over after that. It's like I heard Silent Shout by The Knife. They're the reason, you know, I basically bought a laptop and made music out of it. And I didn't think anyone was, was gonna come to my show at Coachella. Like, <laughs> I had nightmares. When I turned up, the crowd was at capacity. I can be like crying and like, you know, anxious in the corner, like 10 minutes before my show, but I can get off stage and I am completely happy because I've danced myself clean. Every milestone that I hit is just like a starting point to the next milestone for me. And if I ever stop loving it, I'll stop. And that's all I know. It's a pretty exciting time to be us right now, looking down the barrel of Coachella. I have never been to Coachella, and people were giving me a lot of guff. I'm gonna go to Coachella when I play Coachella. So we have a lot of surprises. Six choreographed showgirls coming on stage in full matching attire. With the, it's gonna be this crazy kind of production. We've been in Europe playing our headline shows and playing festivals and to come back to LA, like to have a hometown show be Coachella, like it's just like, it's been this like elusive thing for so long, this thing we wanted. Coachella, Coachella, like someday, someday, you know, and, and you know, it's now, it's happening, so. Of course, I'm happy I'm, I'm on the top of the world. Coachella has certain challenges that we have to think about. A hypercube is a, a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object. It creates a, almost a holographic 3D experience. So one of the issues with Coachella that sometimes people face is uh, that there's dust storms. Big outdoor festivals with a lot of ambient light where the, the stage sizes are so big that it might even dwarf a massive production. So right now we're just trying to figure out what's our best approach. Meanwhile, John's working on all the production and I'm working with animators to try to up the level of the show for Coachella. And every year Dulab gets a commission and they design something custom and special for Coachella. First in a stage, in a warehouse, and then they bring it and deploy it out in the field. So the structure we're building uh, is called Big Fish. And it's a very exciting run up to the finish line where the builders are literally swinging hammers, riveting bolts uh, up until the very last minute. And by the time the park doors finally open and everyone's let into Coachella, it's a big, beautiful excitement for everybody. Today was our inaugural event in Los Angeles at the Santa Monica Pier. The event was to demonstrate who use cannabis can also have active, healthy, athletic lifestyle. You know, it's going to be a great thing for it to be legalized everywhere. And we need to fix the law to catch up with the reality. This is a multi-billion dollar industry we need to tap into. This is a big part of your health positive lifestyle. What I want
wanted to bring was a Vietnamese type of restaurant that was inviting and that it is authentic. I'm not trying to do you know, Asian fusion here. There's a little bit of fusion. I let the customers know that if I adjust certain dishes without an integral part of the dish, it's not going to taste the same. So but don't forget, we're in the hospitality business. Just like you come to my house, if you don't like something or, or a flavor, I might have to adjust it for you. And that's okay with me. I'm not really trying to change the game. I'm just trying to make good food, good food. Uh, being born and raised here in LA, it needs to feel real. I keep this natural state, keeping it fresh, but without being over pretentious about it. We serve uh, what I like to call Chicano food. And basically it's things that I ate growing up. Street food that we serve uh, has a lot of restaurant background and we want to bring like that quality. Uh, we serve tamales here. We butterfly our masa and serve it open faced. I'm serving a shrimp cocktail. Elote with the coriander butter. And we're topping it with a whipped cotija and a fresh chili powder that I make uh, myself. So our staple item is actually our pozole. Today we have a lamb stew, fresh hominy in there. We put cool toppings on top, uh, everything's very fresh, and we all have the same goals. And that's basically to just work our butts off and do something that we love, and that's serving people. That's what I love to do, and at the end of the day, that's what I do. An Olveta Street launched in 1930. In order to promote Olveta Street, they invited David Alfaro Siqueiros to paint a mural here. The idea of Tropical America was supposed to be an idealized painting. Instead, he painted a very radical image, jungles um, overgrowing this whole civilization. In the corners, you see Chacmo and pre-Columbian figures. In the far right-hand corner, you see two snipers a Mexican and a Peruvian, aiming their guns at the capitalist eagle. It was 18 by 80 foot long, and what you see in that mural is a Mayan pyramid in destruction. The mural has an interpretive center down below, a viewing platform on the second floor, and then a protective shelter. We feel like we are the caretakers of this mural, which is a very important piece of the history of Los Angeles. And a really significant legacy that David Alfaro Sicaros left to us. So you need to come to, to the city's birthplace to see where it all started. And that's here at El Pueblo Historical Monument, America Tropical. As a chef, you get that opportunity to create um, a really nice moment for someone else. So today I'm exploring the Metro Red Line. Let's adventure. Let's get a tap card. One way. But if you really want to transfer, don't forget to bring your tap card. They're going to be checking for the blue lines blue, think of the sky. Red lines red, think of red for underground, blue for above ground. Welcome to NoHo. So we're here at the Green Man. It's one of the many beautiful and eclectic stops that you can find off the red line in North Hollywood. And I love the fact that I can be traffic hands down the fastest route to get downtown. Oh, perfect, right here. Little Tokyo. LA is huge. There's a lot to do. So grab a tap car and go and explore. Metro Red Line, get on or get off. And to express myself honestly, you know, that, my friend, is very hard to do and you have to train 
you have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it, it's there. That image that grabs you on the screen when you see him on film is because he was a very whole human being. It's very vital and it leaps off of the screen at you. I was four when my father died, which is really young, but the most vivid memory that I have of him is what it felt like to be in his presence. And it made you feel engaged and excited and safe. You know what I want to think of myself? As a human being. Because, I mean, I don't want to sound like, you know, as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people are different. My father was a child actor in Hong Kong, but when he left there, he had no intention of acting again. Mm -hmm. But he was giving an exhibition and he was actually discovered. And they called him in and he did a screen test. Uh, he's so dynamic, even though you can tell he's young, he's a little nervous. <laughs> they have the tiger that start like a tiger. It's really my goal and my dream to let people know about Bruce Lee the philosopher. LA is a very special place. Um, it's my home. It was my father's home. He always intended to come back. When he passed away, he was considered a resident and domicile of California because we were coming back. My wish is to make the world a better place through my own actions, but also by being an amplifier for my father's philosophy and the way he lived his life. He was able to accomplish and make so much impact in such a short amount of time that that is lasting and continuing to inspire people today. And we're still talking about him 43 years later because of that. I have no fear of opponent in front of me, that I am very self-sufficient, that they do not bother me. And that should I fight, should I do anything, I have made up my mind, and that's it, baby. You better kill me before. This was a day of joy and light and exaltation in one of the darkest places in our city. Because the music makes us understand each other. It makes us open. To me, my biggest dream was actually be able to, to, to sing for my people in Skid Row. I wouldn't feel bad as looking at the condition because the music began to surround me and began to lift me up. People who are living on our streets are somebody's children, somebody's mother, father, brother, sister. They are you or me divided by circumstance. And they ask us for help, we are here. We are here every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are our homeless community's family. I shoot pictures of my friends all over Los Angeles. You want to be there at the moment. Racing cars in the desert is like doing something gnarly. Xander is one of those people that I always heard about. It can extend through the phone, through the internet. He's just that kind of guy. So I got in this accident. You know, in the beginning I was really scared because I, I didn't know what I was going to be able to do. I, I made a Facebook status. You know, I'm going to be okay. The doctor said I'm going to be okay. Something. But it got the most likes out of anything I've ever posted. I knew I was doing something right. So I get out of the hospital and I'm just like, let's, let's just go. Let's start with this like new life. All these friends, I go to the beach, I go to the mountains, I go to Mammoth, I go to Coachella. I was naked in my wheelchair on the freeway. Fun and fast and that's how my life was before the wheelchair. That's how it still is, but I just can't walk anymore. My camera is just there to, to capture this amazing life that I've been fortunate enough to be put in. helping young, upcoming, emerging LA artists build a portfolio. All the stars align, spanning the valley and the west side. He really wants to collectivize. All love, all LA. And how much he just loves everything about everyone. That's who Xander is. I want people to see us enjoying our lives. I want everyone to be enjoying their lives. Share it with as many people as possible. 
Yeah, I'm in a wheelchair, but like, there's nothing to complain about. Let's have fun. Let's have fun with friends. Let's go places. It's never too late to be who you want to be. That's my life. Some people claim hip hop should have never changed since the 90s. I'ma come clean. I was born in 92. I love everything about the genre. We're making a new sound out here. Out here, 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 out here. It's real music. Get educated. Some people claim Some people claim Some people claim hip hop should have never changed since the 90s I'ma come clean, I was born in 92 I love everything about the genre We're making a new sound out here Out here, out here, out here